Science has given us some remarkable things. Medicine, physics, our understanding of biology and the cosmos. But we humans are flawed. And so, inevitably, there are scientists who have carried out some ridiculous and downright wicked experiments throughout history. From trying to prove that mice spontaneously generate from wheat, to a scientist who intentionally infected himself with diseases, to a theory that nearly led to the starvation of an entire continent, here are some of history's most wickedly bizarre science experiments that crashed and burned. Separating Triplets the question of nature versus nurture has vexed scientists for centuries. Back in the 60s and 70s, one New York City psychologist tried to answer the question once and for all, but his methods were so controversial that the results are still sealed in a vault at Yale University and can't be opened until 2066. In the early 60s, Dr. Peter Neubauer and Viola Bernard set out to try and see whether genetics or the environment someone grows up in affects that person's development more. The best way to do it, they figured, was to split up identical twins and triplets at birth and keep tabs on them over the years without either of them knowing the other existed. Neubauer went to an adoption agency in New York City and convinced the employees there to split up these twins at birth and give them to different families that lived far enough away so one twin didn't know the other existed and close enough that Neubauer and his team could make house calls each year and monitor how they are doing. Not even the families that adopted the twins knew about the experiment. It was all very hush-hush. Neubauer did this to at least five sets of twins during the 60s and 70s, but the most publicized and tragic case was of a set of triplets he split up early on in the experiment. One infant went to a working-class family, one went to a middle-class family, and one went to an upper-middle-class family in a twisted version of social lottery. Neubauer would then go in and check on them every year for the first 10 years of their lives. Eddie, David, and Bobby went on to have issues growing up. Eddie and David spent time in and out of mental hospitals, and Bobby was put on probation after he pleaded guilty to charges that involved the death of a woman during a robbery. When the three learned that they were triplets in 1980 after two of them ended up enrolling in the same community college, their reunion became a national sensation. They were all over the news. They even opened up their own restaurant in New York City, which made a million dollars in its first year. Despite growing up without knowing each other, they had the same interests, the same IQ, they all wrestled and had the same moves. But deep down, it seems that their separation had negative consequences. Eddie wound up taking his own life in 1995. And while we may never know definitively whether Neubauer's study directly contributed to it, the fact that it might have is testament enough to the moral slipperiness of the experiment. Neubauer had the results of the experiment sealed until 2066 out of respect for the lives of the people involved. So we might have to wait until then. Sweaty clothes plus wheat equals mice. Back in ancient Greece, Aristotle came up with the idea that life could spontaneously burst forth from non-living things. Animals like insects and oysters emerge from, quote, putrefying earth or vegetable matter because everything on this earth has something he called vital heat, which indicated that all matter had some sort of soul. His idea spread around the Western world. Similar ideas, dare I say, spontaneously emerged even earlier in the East. In Babylon, people thought worms popped up from mud. In India, flies were the babies of dirt and sweat. And in China, aphids were born from bamboo. The idea persisted into the 1600s. By then, people had vials and mathematical equations and labs. It was around this time that the apple fell on Newton's head. The scientific revolution was in full swing. But just like in baseball, there were often more whiffs than hits. People still thought bad air caused disease, that if someone was wounded, putting salve on the weapon would heal the wound. We weren't quite quantum physicists yet. Enter Jan van Helmont. Van Helmont is considered the father of pneumatic chemistry, or the study of gases, which back then were called airs. But tucked away in his notes were some ideas that were almost entirely full of air. Van Helmont wrote that mice could pop into existence from sweaty shirts and wheat grains. He suggested that if you stuck a sweaty shirt and wheat grains into an open mouth jar, then after about 21 days, the fermentation from the shirt would interact with the wheat to produce mice. The idea sprang from the observation that mice often appeared in areas where grains and clothing were stored, without understanding the actual breeding habits of mice. Whoops! Louis Pasteur would come along in the 1800s and finally prove that life has to come from other life. Wilhelm Reich's Cloudbusters. 
Wilhelm Reich was one of the most radical and controversial psychoanalysts of the 1900s. He coined the term carnal revolution and wrote startlingly elusive observations on the rise of the Nazis and the mechanisms behind the ideas of fascism. But he also thought that extraterrestrials were shooting toxic levels of life force at the Earth and tried to build a machine to stop them, a quest that eventually got him in trouble with the U.S. government and landed him in prison. Reich was deeply influenced by Sigmund Freud's work, particularly the concept of libido or carnal energy. Reich's perspective split from mainstream psychoanalysis in a fundamental way, though. He believed that the libido was a real physical energy that flowed within the body and could be measured. He called this energy orgone. It was an omnipresent cosmic energy that permeated everything from the human body to the atmosphere. According to Reich, orgone had the power to influence all kinds of things, from human emotions and health to weather patterns and even the color of the sky. Reich's dedication to studying orgone led him to create devices known as orgone accumulators. These were boxes made of layers of organic and inorganic materials designed to gather and concentrate orgone energy. He claimed that sitting inside these accumulators could heal illness and disease by balancing the body's orgone levels. Reich's theories took an even stranger turn in the 1950s. He got the idea in his head that our planet was being bombarded by deadly orgone, or DOR, which he thought was coming from outer space. How was this deadly orgone getting to us? Aliens, of course. Aliens were attacking Earth with its harmful radiation to stifle the life-enhancing properties of orgone energy. To fight this extraterrestrial threat, Reich and his son, Peter, came up with something called the Cloud Buster. The machine consisted of a series of large tubes that were connected to hoses and submerged in water. Its purpose was to draw the deadly radiation out of the atmosphere. Reich figured that by doing this, he could cleanse the atmosphere of DOR, neutralize the alien threat, and maybe even influence weather patterns so he could enjoy more beach days in the summer. Did you really think that about the summer? Really? The U.S. Food and Drug Administration eventually hit Reich with an injunction, not for his cloudbuster stuff, but for shipping his Oregon accumulators across state lines. Eventually, he was arrested and sentenced to two years in prison. He died of heart failure in his jail cell just a few months into his sentence. Do you think the cloudbuster would have worked? Project A119. In 1959, U.S. scientists working for the Air Force published a paper titled A Study of Lunar Research Flights, Volume 1. The title sounds innocent enough. The United States was in a Cold War with the Soviet Union to see who could get to the moon first and brand it with their nationalism. But within the pages of that paper was something a lot more sinister, something that, if it was actually carried out, could have had some pretty extreme consequences. Two years earlier, in 1957, the Soviets launched the Sputnik satellite into space. Politicians and scientists in the United States raised their eyebrows and wanted to demonstrate that their country was superior to all others in the Cold War's frequently childish tit-for-tat fighting. That scientific paper was part of Project A119. The goal of the project was to send an atomic warhead to the moon and create an explosion so big that the Soviets and everyone else would see it and be afraid. Very afraid. Since the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, there wouldn't be the trademark mushroom cloud. But American scientists figured targeting the point where the dark side of the moon met the light side would create a large enough flash for everyone to see. A team of scientists was assembled to see how feasible the plan was. One of those scientists was none other than Carl Sagan. Sagan was tasked with modeling the behavior of dust and gas from a potential atomic explosion on the moon. The fact that we even know that Project A119 existed was actually because Sagan mentioned it in a university application back in the day. Needless to say, the U.S. eventually gave up on their dream to make the moon go boom. If they had, who knows how it would have changed the dynamic between the Soviet Union and the United States. The Vomit Drinking Doctor In the late 17 and early 1800s, yellow fever rampaged through cities across the U.S. One trainee doctor in Philadelphia had a theory. The disease wasn't contagious. It was simply that people tended to get sick in the hot summer months due to the unsanitary conditions of most cities at the time. The medical student, Steubens Firth, unique name, right? Went about trying to prove it in a series of experiments, stranger and more disgusting than his name. Sitting around in a lab at the University of Pennsylvania, Firth decided it would be best to just try some stuff out on himself. He was either so confident that the disease wasn't contagious or so desperate to get his degree that he was willing to die in the name of science. 
he went and found some patients suffering from the later stages of the illness and then started doing things that would make Fear Factor era Joe Rogan dry heave. He took the black vomit these patients spewed up towards the end of their illness and, well, consumed it. When that didn't work, he poured some into his eyes. When that didn't have any effect, he inhaled the fumes of heated samples. Still yellow feverless, Firth then tried to pour it onto a cut he made on his skin, and still, nothing. After not contracting the disease, Firth triumphantly announced that yellow fever was absolutely not contagious and wrote a paper in 1804 titled A Treatise on Malignant Fever with an attempt to prove its non-contagious, non-malignant nature. There was one problem, though. The patients he was taking samples from were in the later stages of the disease where it was no longer contagious. Also, it spreads through mosquito bites, and the only way to transmit it is through a direct injection of infected blood, which despite all his different gross experiments, Firth never tried. So you can guess how many people read his paper and thought to themselves, wow, this guy's a genius. Yellow fever isn't contagious. Maybe the most disgusting part of the whole story is that Stubbings Firth actually received his doctorate from the University of Pennsylvania and became an actual practicing physician. The man who almost ruined agriculture. If more people had listened to Soviet scientist Trofim Lysenko, the world might have been faced with a near catastrophic agricultural failure. Trofim Lysenko was a Soviet agronomist who became hugely influential in the 1930s and 1940s. His claim to fame was his rejection of Mendelian genetics in favor of his own theories, which came to be known as Lysenkoism. Mendelian genetics, named after its pioneer Gregor Mendel, is a study of how traits are inherited from one generation to the next. Basically, Mendel discovered that organisms inherit two factors, which we now call genes, for each trait, one from each parent. These genes can be dominant or recessive, and their combinations determine the appearance of the trait in the offspring. Lysenko said no thank you to all of that. Instead, he believed in the inheritance of so-called acquired characteristics. Basically, he proposed that environmental changes could directly alter an organism's traits, and these changes could then be passed on to subsequent generations. For example, if a plant was exposed to cold temperatures and adapted to it, Lysenko thought its offspring would inherit this adaptation. It was like saying that a man who hit the gym a lot during his life and got ripped would pass his big muscles onto his kid. Basically, instagenetics. Lysenko conducted a ton of experiments to support his theories, many of which were tenuous at best in terms of scientific rigor. In one, Lysenko claimed that by exposing winter crops to moisture and cold, he could convert them into spring varieties. While cold treatments can definitely accelerate the maturation of certain winter grains, Lysenko exaggerated how effective it was and denied any genetic basis for the phenomenon. Lysenko also believed that plants of the same species didn't compete with each other, but instead benefited from being closely planted. This just wasn't true, and crop yields in the Soviet Union would soon plummet because of Lysenko's flawed logic. In 1940, Lysenko was appointed as the director of the Institute of Genetics within the USSR's Academy of Sciences. With Joseph Stalin's support and the political cloud of the Soviet establishment behind him, Lysenko used his position to suppress Mendelian genetics and promote his own theories. Lysenkoism became the state-sanctioned doctrine. Any criticism of it was labeled as bourgeois or fascist. Any scientific debate and research on the topic was shut down. This inevitably led to the arrest and imprisonment of some of the Soviet Union's top geneticists. One, Nikolai Vavilov, went from being Lysenko's mentor to pass it away from starvation in a prison in 1943. Textbooks were even rewritten to align with Lysenko's views, and Mendelian genetics was removed from the curriculum in schools. Throughout the 30s, 40s, and 50s, the Soviet Union faced all kinds of food shortages and famines. And while it's difficult to quantify the actual impact of Lysenko's pseudoscientific agricultural theories, it most definitely helped exacerbate the problem. Thanks for watching. What other scientific experiments do you want to learn about? Let us know in the comments. And don't forget to like and subscribe for more Nutty History.